Say peace and blessings, family. I want to say shalom, lock, mash, pakha. I know it's late night for many of us, but I still wanted to just setting things up. I still wanted to jump out here and do this late night session um, that I said I would do. I said I would do a session tonight. I wanted to do it a little earlier, but I had to clean up the presentation. This is a very old presentation that I taught years ago about a series that I did called Words of Confusion. And so uh, when we start addressing a lot of the words of confusion, um, it'll make a world of a difference in understanding the text. And so tonight we're going to focus on uh, Jew, Greek, Gentile. Those are three words of confusion that makes a world of a difference in our understanding of the text. So before I get started, I'm going to um, acknowledge some of you guys that are here. I want to say shalom, um, salama to um, Brother Antonio. Appreciate your support. And also say shalom, lak, mash, pakha to um, Child of the Way. Appreciate you guys. I know it's late. I uh, want to say also peace and blessings to Av Yah. So really appreciate you guys for tuning in. And um, again, I know that um, there was no notifications or anything like that because I didn't put anything out there. So again, tonight, we're going to deal with the word Jew. We're going to deal with the word Greek. And we're going to deal with the word Gentile. Because again, these are words of confusion that have a major, uh, a major influence or a major impact um, on how we understand the text. And many of us don't even realize that before we even read scripture, we have already been pre-programmed to accepting certain things because of how, you know, um, words have been defined for us. And we never questioned those, those words. You know, you have so many of us to have spent money uh, to obtain a higher level of academia, you know, um, and pay money, good, uh, I mean, good money for an education that still um, taught this confusion and supported this confusion. And we're going to deal with that tonight. Jew, Gentile, um, Jew, Greek, Gentile, words of confusion. And so I'm going to, you know, kind of incorporate this into the playbook. We'll deal with the word church, give you proper clarity on church, because many of you heard me say a number of times that um, Israel was never referred to as a church. That is another word of confusion. But yet, every time we say that word church, we're actually promoting replacement theology. Replacement theology. So we're going to deal with some words of confusion. And tonight we're going to deal with Jew, Greek and Gentile. All right. This is a lengthy presentation, but try to uh, condense it. I tried to condense it down. So I'm going to say peace and blessings to child of the way. I appreciate your support. Um, and I'm just doing everything I can 
to try to make it easier for you guys, um, especially those are that are new to this awakening, uh, just so that way you have some uh, a place that you could go and get some foundational uh, understanding on key words, you know, and um, anyone can challenge it. You know, anyone can challenge my teachings. You know, um, if they feel like I'm wrong, challenge me. But I can tell you for sure, everything that I post is is accurate. I know that for sure. And so with tonight, that's why that's why, um, I, you know, uh, to Child of the Way and some of the other my other brothers and sisters that have been that have been very supportive. That's why I'm doing what I do, you know, because I don't want uh, many of you guys to make the um, the same mistake that I've made. I made a number of errors because. And many of us have done that. Pastors have done that. You know, we've accepted a template. We've accepted um, a set of teachings that we never questioned. Even deep down inside, we knew something just some things just didn't line up, but yet we accepted it anyway. And so I had to repent on that. I had to repent. I had to repent. And, and, and we'll deal with that another time with some of the things, some of the scriptures that just really shifted. See, you know, I already knew that I was, you know, that I'm a Hebrew Israelite, I always knew that. But the problem was I still fell under the Christianity, the teachings of Christianity. And so Christianity um, is a system, a religious system that was built off of a heritage that did not belong to them. And now they use our Hebrew Israelite Messiah to basically push us out the way and take a heritage that was never theirs. They still hold on to their heritage, land, family and tongues. But then they take the salvation. They take our heritage and use our heritage also as part of their heritage and tell us that it's not ours. It's, you know, um, it's it's. Um, so intertwined with deception, different layers of, of deception. So we're going to get started here. I don't want to prolong the um, time because I, I know it's already late for many of you guys. And so prayerfully, um, there's no issues with the, the the video for you guys. And if you have any questions, we'll, we'll pause. So the first half of this lesson, we're going to deal with Gentile. Then the second half of this lesson, we're going to deal with the word Jew. All right. Again, this first le- uh, the first portion of this lesson, we're going to deal with uh, Gentile, Greek and Gentile. And then the second half of this lesson, we are going to deal with the word Jew. All right. So, again, I appreciate you. Um, um, Yuda Yire, appreciate you. Um, thank you. Continue to pray for me. Um, it's not easy doing, doing what I do because uh, so many have turned their backs. You know, I'm talking about pastors and began to do a lot of mischievous things and um, pass around all kinds of lies and spread lies. And I'm teaching another guy, all kinds of crazy stuff. So just keep um, keep us lifted up in prayer, uh, me and my family, as well as our assembly. So appreciate you guys up next. Appreciate you as well. Now, when I say this is in some forms, folks get their <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Yeah. Hey, but that's what happens. You know, unfortunately, the truth have become the new hate speech of today. All right. So let's go ahead and get started. Let's go ahead and get started. Let me go ahead and adjust my screen here. So that way you guys can see the full presentation. I want to get myself out of the way and uh, feel free to ask questions. But again, words of confusion, Jew, Greek, Gentile. All right. So you guys know how I do. I'm going to walk you through this just to kind of show you um, some of the, the patterns, some of the angles of, of how I go, you know, what I go through as far as, you know, deductive reasoning and, you know, really doing a lot of comparisons and going deep into this in the text, you know, um, in terms of exegete the text. All right. So let's go ahead and get into it. All right. Let's start with Romans chapter nine, verse twenty four. Romans chapter nine, verse 24. And as you see in the background, you know, I like to when I do my PowerPoint presentations, I like to have images of some of the struggles that we had to deal with. 
you know, what you see in the picture back here, I mean, the background on your screen, this is from, um, you know, during the time of um, black or red summer, where over 36 um, communities of ours across the country was bombed, was um, attacked, was under um, the spirit of lynching. You know, this was like genification on uh, on steroids. And so these brothers right here was falsely accused of murder. All right. Which um, um, for once during that time, the legal system actually uh, ruled in their favor, it took the Supreme Court. All right. So we'll deal with that as well. The Elena um, massacre it was it was a very um, gruesome massacre that took place uh, with our brothers and sisters being lynched. All right. And we'll deal with that. And it's a video within uh, We Woke is a short video that really deals with this as well, but we are going to deal with it some more, um, but we'll do that in the near future. All right, so I like to have that in my backdrops, just images to remind us of where we are, where we come from, and we still have a long way to go. And for us to understand salvation, truly understand salvation, that salvation is more than what Christianity Catholicism has taught us of just, hey, you know what? You believe in Christ, your soul, um, you know, is right with Christ. Your soul is right with, with God. Your soul is right. You know, you got the Holy Spirit. That's all you need. That's that's your identity. And that's absolutely incorrect when you understand the scriptures. All right. So nevertheless, let's go ahead and get into this. Romans chapter nine, verse um, 24. And it reads, even us. Whom hath called not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. This is one of the scriptures that many would use. Cherry pick. I can and I've already done it. I did a full I exegeted the entire chapter and I can prove line by line that that entire chapter, this entire chapter is dealing with. Israel. All right. The northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. All right. But we're not going to go through the whole chapter of Romans, but I'm just going to uh, I just want to let you know uh, when you see where you see everywhere you see Gentile. Right. Doesn't necessarily mean what we think it means. Many cases, it's referring to the northern kingdom. All right. And I want to make it clear all through the what many call the Old Testament. I refer to it as the established covenant all through the established covenant. Right. Once you get uh, to the last couple of chapters of Judges. Right. That's where you start understanding and seeing how Israel became a divided kingdom. And so once you get past that point and once Israel officially became a divided kingdom, you know, from that point on, you see the references of the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. You see that theme all through the laws and or, or should I say the the book of the kings on through the prophets uh, all the way to the book of Malachi. You see all of you see that theme, right? Hi, identifying the northern and southern kingdom. But then when we get to um, the renewed covenant, right, when we get there, the testimonies of the Hebrew Israelite Messiah, the letters of the Apostle Paul, when we get to those letters and testimonies, we no longer see the northern southern kingdom. We no longer see that theme. And that should raise questions. And that's what it did for me all through. I'm like, uh, because I'm an analyst as well. I'm I'm a geek. I, I am a geek. You guys hear me say this over and over again. So I analyze. I analyze patterns. I analyze data. Right. So growing up, I was called ghetto geek. I was also referred to as the brain from peeking the brain because I was told that I always look like I'm up to something. I always look like I'm scheming or trying to um, put together a plan to take over the world. All right. So nevertheless, let's go ahead and um, deal with this here. So, again, even us whom he hath called, not of the Jews, but only, oh, excuse me, Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. 
So the question is, what is a Gentile? What is a Gentile? I'll ask that question again. What is a Gentile? Most would say, right? And of course, that check mark came up unexpectedly. I, I have to work on my animations. But most would say that the word Gentile refers to all who are not Jews. And so you see the check, right? Of saying that that's correct. But notice I put another mark on your screen. An X to say that that is incorrect. And I'm going to show you why I put both checks up here. All right. I'm going to walk you through and you could go back over, review this video uh, over and over again, take notes. But you will see that where you see that word Gentile, where you see that term Jew and Gentile, you will see that it's referring to the northern kingdom. But I'm also going to show when you see the term Gentile in some places, and I'm going to give you a key scripture. That it is referring to those that are not blood descendants of Israel. OK, and I'm going to give you clarity with scripture. All right. So is this correct? Is is it is it correct? What I just stated, is it correct? Were Israelites ever called Gentiles. All right. So if this is a case, right. And in the case right now, if this was a case and you guys are the jury, I'm going to have to show you evidence. Okay. I'm going to have to show you evidence, indisputable evidence to prove my case. So you guys, you guys are the jury. So now I am going to present my case to you as if you are a jury. Uh, you guys are the jury and I am the lawyer or the attorney or the prosecutor that is bringing charges against those that are poorly teaching the scriptures. All right. So I'm going to present my case to you. OK, so now we're going to go through what they call in, the, in court in the legal system, the presentation of the evidence. All right, we're going to go through the presentation of the evidence. So let's go ahead and get into it. Let's start with Easton's Bible Dictionary, 1894, definition of Gentile. Now, you could download this dictionary for free, all right, from like archive.org and some of the other sites. You can download this dictionary for free. It has some um, very helpful information in it. So, I, I, you know, so the references that I give. Write it down and obtain many of the many of the um, sources that I'm going to quote uh, tonight. You can obtain for free. OK. So let's see what the Eastern Bible Dictionary says. It says Gentile. And notice what it says. Hebrews, usually in plural, goyim. It says usually in plural. But let's look at what else is highlighted here. It says Meaning in general, all nations except the Jews. Now, this right here should raise questions. And as I said, I am a geek. I'm an analyst. OK, I analyze things. OK, so meaning in general. Right. The common consensus. Right. Uh, general. Also, remember what we talked about is universal. Catholic. Generic. All right. So meaning in general. All nations except the Jews. In course of time, as the Jews began more and more to pride themselves on their particular or should, should I say peculiar, excuse me, privileges, it acquired unpleasant associations and was used as a term of contempt. Let me read that one more time. Gentiles, meaning in general, all nations except the Jews. In the course of time, as the Jews began more and more to pride themselves on their peculiar privileges, it acquired unpleasant associations and was used as a term of contempt. It goes on to say, in the New Testament, the Greek word Hellenes, meaning 
literally Greek. And you notice it gives you scriptures of references here. Generally, there we have that word again. I want you to pay attention to it. Generally denotes any non-Jewish nation. Remember that we have that word again, general, common consensus, universal, right? Catholic, generic, right? That, that The primitive root of this word is gene. Okay, so generally denotes any non-Jewish nation. So again, it says in general, all nations except the Jews. So let's deal with the Greek definition of Gentile. Let's see what it says. And for the sake of this presentation um, and many of my um, PowerPoints, I primarily use a comprehensive, strong dictionary of the Bible, compact Bible word index, Hebrew and Greek dictionary with in-depth definitions. All right. So we see here ethnos. And it tells us a race. And it goes on to say an example, tribe, a tribe, especially a foreign, in other words, non-Jewish, one usually by implication, pagan. Then you see some key words here, Gentile, heathen, nation, people. Now make a note of that right there. Gentile, right? Interchangeable with gent uh, um, heathen nation, people. And then when you see um, the, the entries there, the sub entries there, you'll see I just listed three and four. There's others there, but it says a tribe, nation, people, group. Number four, it says in the Old Testament, foreign nations not worshiping the true God, pagans, Gentiles. A little, you know, a nugget I want to give you here, too. When you see the word heathen and you see the word pagan, the difference between the two two words. Pagan is used for civilized. Civilized groups. Civilized countries, civilized people who do not worship. Who do not worship the most high. That's what pagan means. Right. That's what it means. Like the Romans are viewed as being pagans. The Greeks viewed as pagans, civilized. Right. And when you understand uh, when it deals with uh, Islam, they are not listed as being pagans. They're not listed as being heathens. Now, when we see the word heathen everywhere, you see heathen. It's referring to a African territory, a African group of people. Right. Fact. But they refer to them. Look up the word, do the etymology of the word, and you will see that it will tell you that um, uncivilized idol worshipers. Uncivilized. So we know when you start understanding um, the writings of the 18th century, the 19th century, you'll see that they always refer to our people as uncivilized especially when we deal with the Willie Lynch letter. They refer to those that are uncivilized. In other words, those that were not what that really, uh, or should I say those that fight against their oppressive system, those that fought against slavery, those that would not just lay down and allow these, um, um, these colonizers, you know, those that have enslaved our people would not just accept, just lay down and just allow them to do whatever they want to do. So the Willie Lynch letter made a distinction between uncivilized and civilized. Civilized are those that they broke, those that they uh, um, uh, finally, through all their cruelties, forced them into submission. All right. So when you see heathen, it's referring to uncivilized Africans, uncivilized Negroes. When you see pagans, it's referring to the Greeks, it's referring to the Romans, countries that they deem to be civilized. All right. So I want to share that little piece of history with that. So I hope you understand that. OK, so let's go a little further with this. OK, let's go a little further with this. So, again, ethnos. OK, um, when we start dealing with the word Gentile. Key words, 
heathen nation people. All right, so again, especially a foreign non-Jewish. Notice how we we keep getting that non-Jewish, that word Jewish, right? Constantly is being pushed, being forced into our minds, being forced into our thinking, forced into how we properly, or should I say how we uh, process what we're reading. So key words, tribe, nation, people. Let's go back to the Eastern Bible Dictionary. Let's go back here. And I want to reiterate this point. It says in the New Testament, the Greek word Hellenes, meaning literally Greek. But then it says generally denotes any non-Jewish nation. Any non-Jewish nation. So in the renewed covenant, in other words, the New Testament, the word, the, the Greek word Hellenes, meaning literally Greek. So let's see what Hellenes mean. Let's let's go to the definition of this. All right. Let's go to the Greek strong here. Dictionary, in-depth dictionary here. It says here, Hellenin, in other words, Grecian. So when you see Grecian, many cases you'll see Hellenin. But this is what it means, right? Uh, Hellenin, Grecian, in other words, Grecian or inhabitant of Hellas, by extension, a Greek speaking person. Wait a minute. Let me read that again. A Greek speaking person, especially a non-Jew. There we have that term again. Gentile, Greek. But in the in-depth portion of the definition, right? Entry number one, it says a Greek either by nationality. Now pay attention to this. A Greek either by nationality whether a native of the mainland or of the Greek islands or colonies. Entry number two, in a wider sense, right? A general sense, a universal sense. The name embraces all nations, not Jews, that made the language, customs, and learning of the Greeks their own. The primary reference is to a difference of religion and worship. But let's go further here. So Greek is translate is a transliteration of the word Hellenin. OK. Or Helen. All right. So let's go to Acts chapter 16, verse one. Let's confirm this. This is where you will find it at. All right. Then came he to Derby in Lystra. And behold, a certain disciple was there named uh, Timotheus, the son of a certain woman, which was a Jewess and believed, but his father was a Greek. So Timothy mother was a Jewess. In other words, Udeos, right? That's the Greek word. Timothy's father was a Greek, Hellenin. So the question is, was Timothy's father a blood descendant of the Greeks or simply an Israelite who was Hellenized? We have to ask that question. Was Timothy's father a blood I mean, was Timothy's father a blood descendant of the Greeks or simply an Israelite who was Hellenized? That's a good question to ask. All right. Because Hellenin also means Grecians. And let me go to. Grecians. What is a Grecian? What is the definition of Grecians? This is what it says. All right. A Hellenist or Greek speaking what? Jew. <laughs> you see how as you start pulling the 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 bananas, you start unpeeling that banana peel, how you see how this can be confusing if you're not what paying attention or if you're not taking the time out to uh, go through each one of these words. If you're not careful, they can start what contradicting each other. All right. So as you see here, Hellenist, right? Remember, Hellenin said had Grecian there. So now we see here a Hellenist or what? Greek speaking Jew. All right. Grecian. And in entry number one, a Hellenist. Okay. Goes on to say, now pay attention to this. 
one who imitates the manners and customs or the worship of the Greeks and use the Greek tongue. All right. See, we have a lot of brothers and sisters that are actual Hebrew Israelites, but can be called Grecians because many of us are what? Especially in church. In church, many pride themselves on being able to what? Go into the Greek. OK, many pastors pride themselves on being able to go into the Greek, but not go into the Hebraic school of thought. Throw a few Greek words around. With one verse and just make the people feel good. So here you see here a under um, sub entry number one, it says one who imitates the manners and customs or the worship of the Greeks and use the Greek tongue. It goes on to say B used in the New Testament of Jews born in foreign lands and speaking Greek. All right, let's go further here. Let's go to Acts chapter six, verse one through three. Let's confirm this. It says here, verse one, and in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. It goes on to say, verse two, then the 12 disciples, or should I say, then the 12 called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, it is not reason that we should leave the word of Allah or the word of Yahweh. Right. You see God on your screen, but that's generally what it transliterates to and serve tables. Verse three, wherefore, brethren. Look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. All right. So before I go further with this, let me just show you what a disciple is. Let me show you what the disciples were doing with these group of candidates that was presented to them. They were Grecians. And I'm going to show you one was a proselyte. All right. But what is a disciple? Lamad. I want you all to understand this right here. It says here, right? We see disciples says a learner. Pupil, disciple, hmm, a learner, pupil, right? A disciple. Right. So a disciple make it to make it clear is someone who is learned in the law. Let me prove this. This is the. Oxford definition of the word learned. So when you see the word learned, this is what it means. Of a person having much knowledge acquired by studying. Let me say that again. Of a person having much knowledge acquired by studying. And then the sub entry of one, 1.1, 1 .1, it says showing, requiring, or characterized by learning, scholarly. All right. So when it says learned, it's a person having a, a, a person who has much knowledge, who have acquired much knowledge through what? Studying. OK, so next question is, what is the law? Let me give you the definition of it. Right. We already dealt with learned, but let me deal with law. That's a little blip in my presentation. But let's see what it says here for, for law. It says a precept or statute. Then we see especially the Decalogue or Pentateuch. But it goes further to say this. This is what's key. It says law, direction, instruction. Whenever we see the word law, it means what? Law, direction, instructions. But then it goes on to say this. Some 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 great things to take to write down. It says instructions, direction. In other words, human or divine. Then when we see. The, the sub entries here, one, it says body of prophetic teachings. Let me say that again. Body of prophetic teachings. Number two, instruction in messianic age. <laughs> wow. Number three, body of priestly directions or instruction. 
Number four, body of legal directives. And I'm going to go further with this. I'm, a, I'm going to do a separate teaching on the covenant. And I'll show you why you hear many say the renewed covenant. And I'll give you clarity on it because many will tell you and say there was there's multiple co covenants that are out there. And I'm going to show you and I can prove that that is completely incorrect with scripture. OK, so we see here when you say law, you also say instructions, directions, body of prophetic teachings, instructions in messianic age, body of priestly directions or instructions, body of legal direction of directives. OK, so let's go to Exodus chapter 24, verse 12. And this will explain it. It says, and Yahweh said unto Moses, come up to me in the mount and be there and and I will give thee tables of stones and a law and commandments which I have written that thou mayest teach them. So a disciple again is is required to know and teach the law. The Hebrew Israelite Messiah taught the law. His disciples taught the law. All right. Isaiah 8 and 16 says this. Bind up the testimony. Seal the law among my disciples, Lamad. Okay, so let's deal with the Hebrew definition of disciple. And I'm going to tie this back in, all right, to Acts chapter 6. Lamad, right? This is the primitive root word, right? It means to teach. But here's the, here's the kicker. Expert, instruct, learn, skillful, teach, teacher. Okay? Now here's the Hebrew word, right? Here's the letter, rather. The Lamad. Right. As you see here, numerical value is 30. It means staff, discipline to learn. Lamad, this number is this number is very important. This is why the Hebrew Israelite Messiah started his ministry at the age of 30. And if you understand Torah, you will see that. In order to what start and, and do certain functions, you had to be at the age of 30. Other functions were at the age of 25. But the age of 30. OK, and we'll deal with that another time. And there you see the pictograph is it looks like what a staff. OK, so the Hebrew Israelite Messiah sealed his disciples and the law. Right. So let's go to Matthew chapter five, verse 17 through 20. All right. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot, all right, one jot, iota. That's the eighth letter in the Greek alphabets that comes from the 10th letter of the Hebrew alphabet, which is the Yod. In the Israeli language is pronounced Yod which this letter means redemption. Okay, so Christ is saying not even touching not one letter, but then it goes on to say, or one tittle. Now, karaz is the Greek word for, when you say tittle, it's saying hair, horns. And when you look at the ancient letters, each letter looks like they have hair or horns. And so when you look at the yod versus the yod now, the yod back in the ancient times, especially the days of Moses versus now, got a haircut. His, its horns were cut. All right. So one tittle, that means hair, horns, and no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled, saying not even a single letter should be changed. Okay. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men, so he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom. That's the key. Whosoever shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men. That's the kick, kicker right there. That's what many teachers, that's what many pastors don't touch on. Okay. All right. So verse 20, for I shall, excuse me, for I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter the kingdom of heaven. In other words, properly teaching the law, statutes and commandments of the most high 
through the example that our um, Masha Yak has given us. All right. So remember, going back to this point, I just want to give you a little nugget there just for those, you know, uh, watching for the first time. I just want to give you that. So let me bring this back in. So remember, a Grecian is a Greek speaking Jew. And we're going to deal with that word Jew. But for now, we're going to say Jew. A Grecian is a Greek speaking Jew. OK, so let's fast forward. All right. So remember, Stephen and Philip, they were Grecians. In other words, they were Greek speaking Jews. OK, I'll say it again. Stephen and Philip were Greek speaking Jews. All right. Let's go back to Acts chapter six, verse five. This is what it says. And not only was it, uh, uh, Philip. But the rest of them were with the exception of Nicholas. All right. So it says here um, in the sayings, excuse me, in the saying, please, the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith. And of the Holy Spirit. And Philip and Prochorus and Nicanor and Timon and um, Parmenas. And Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. So this tells you right here, all the other men here with the exception, all six men with the exception of Nicholas, right, were uh, Jews, right, who was Hellenized. They were uh, Grecians. They were what? Speaking. They were Jews that spoke the Greek language. All right. So I want to make that clear. So Nicholas here is a proselyte of Antioch. Okay, so again, there were six candidates, but only one was not a blood descendant of Israel, and that was Nicholas. So Nicholas was a proselyte. So let's see the definition of proselyte. This is what it means. It says here, an arriver from a foreign region, region um, an example, um, and and setter, in other words, convert to Judaism. A convert. So when you see proselyte, that is a convert. And I don't like to use the term Judaism because our ancestors did not practice Judaism. When we think of Judaism, this is what, you know, we automatically think about what's being practiced today. Our ancestors did not practice none of this crazy stuff that we see today that is masked under uh, under Torah. OK, so we'll deal with that another time. All right. Even though I'm dealing with it a lot on on this channel. But nevertheless, what did we learn so far? So let's break it down. The word Greek. Right. The Greek word for the Gentiles is Hellenes. Right. Hellenin also means Grecian. So Hellenes. Right. Greek means all who are not Jews. That, that you see how it's all twisted here. So Grecians mean Jews who it, it means that Jews who imitate Greek born in foreign lands and speak Greek. <laughs> right. So if you're not careful, this this can be uh, almost like a, a tongue twister here. But nevertheless, Grecians means Jews who imitate Greeks born in foreign lands and speak Greek. So remember, Gentile also means tribe, nation, people. OK, so let me prove this here, because one of the things when you come up in the church, many within the church don't even understand that. Guess what? Uh, you know, you have Israelites that was uh, Israelites was referred to as nations. And I'm going to prove it here right now. All right. Gentiles was not just referred to all those that are not Jews, per se. And we're going to deal with that word Jew pretty soon. All right. Because when we understand the word Gentile, it simply means what? Nation, tribes, people. So let's deal with the nations of Japheth. I'm not going to go into the identity portion of it, but just want to make um, give, prove my point here. Genesis chapter 10, verse five. It says this. By these were the isles of the Gentiles. And I'm going to read it from uh, ancient Hebrew perspective. Gawayam divided in their lands. Everyone after his tongues, after their family and their nations, Gawai Yaham. All right. So land, Aratazah, 
All right. Some would say Eret. All right. Not getting into all of that. Um, tongues, Lashan, families, Mash, Paka. All right. But it says this in their nations. All right. So you see Ga Wayam or Gayim. All right. So you see that 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 word, the, the Hebrew word is used. What Gentiles is being um, that transliterates to being Gentiles is referred to Japheth and his and their descendants, his descendants. All right. So, again, the paleo Hebrew word for nation is, uh, as you see here, the ha, that just means the. All right. That's a prefix. All right. So Gawayam. All right. Gawayam is the proper pronunciation. So, again, this is just giving you the paleo, paleo uh, writings of what um, Hebrew, I mean, what nation is. So, again, that first letter is um, Ga. The next one is um, the Wa or Gamal, the Wa, um, the um, the Yad, the Ha, the Mayam. Right. So you'll pronounce it Gawayam. OK, so let's deal with the nation of Ham. All right. Genesis chapter 10, verse 20. It says this. These are the sons of Ham or Ham. That's the proper pronunciation. Ham. OK. After their families that we see it again, families, Mash Paka, after their tongues, Lash, uh, uh, Lashan and their countries. Right. Uh, and, and we can still tie that in with Aratazai. Right. Land and and their nations. Right. And still it's going to be the same Hebrew word here. Gawayaham, right? So then when we go to Shem in the same scriptures, Genesis chapter 10, verse 31, this is what it says. These are the sons of Shem after their families, Mashapaka, after their tongues, Lashan, and their lands, Aratazah, after their nations. It's still going to be the same. All right? It's going to be the same. Gawayaham, right? That's what you will see in the ancient writings. So is the paleo Hebrew word for Gentile in this scripture exclusively used for Japheth? Absolutely not. OK, so let's go to Genesis 10, verse 32. Let's see what it says. It says this. These are the families of the sons of Noah after their generations and their nations. There we had that word. Gawayaham. And by these were the nations. Gawayaham. Yam divided in the earth after the flood. Right. So understand this. Isle of the Gentiles simply means divided nations along the coast. OK, so the paleo Hebrew word for Gentiles is not used exclusively for the descendants of Japheth. And I just proved that here. All right. So with that being said, I'm going to deal with the Jew. We're going to get to the Jew portion portion of this lesson here. And then uh, we'll, we'll we'll deal with some of your comments here. Let's see what we have here. We're going to continue on. So if you want to take a quick break, do so. But let's deal with it real quick. Let me see here. Uh, I'm just going to read some of the comments here before we move forward. Uh, let's see. Uh, Truth Talk with Shawnee. Uh, OK, that's a response to someone within the comments here. Let's see here. What, what do we have here? I want to say peace and blessings to Yahuza Yakoba. I want to say peace and blessings to uh, Rochelle, Yah's daughter. I uh, want to say peace and blessings to Up Next. Let's see here. So many write off this understanding before doing the deep dive you're doing now. Appreciate it, brother. Absolutely. And I've been brushed off by a no number of pastors trying to show them um, exactly what the scripture says. And many of them, they brush it off and they still continue to do what they choose to do. All right. Let's see here. Uh, all right. So let's go ahead and go and move forward here. All right. So let's deal with the word Jew. So we already see the, the term Gentile. Right. We know what it means. It, it simply means. All right. Um, nations. <laughs> you know, we know that. And we did. We dealt with the um, Greek words as well. But we know that Gentiles nations is interchangeable with the word heathen is interchangeable with people, is interchangeable with tribes. We dealt with Hellenists, we dealt with Hellenes, right? We dealt with Helen, we dealt with Grecian. So we, we we dealt with that. But let's get with this word right here. Okay. We we it's easy to really understand the Gentile portion. It's very easy. But this is the word 
that really confuses so many people. This word Jew, and I'm going to keep showing this reference here. Um, I still haven't had any takers to explain this. Um, what I'm about to show you, that's in the Jewish Almanac. I still haven't had anyone to explain this right here. Right. This coming out of the Jewish Almanac, 1980, page three, a brief history of the term for Jew. Right. I still haven't had any any anyone from the Jewish community explain this to me from their own almanac that's written by their people. Strictly speaking, it is incorrect to call an ancient Israelite a Jew or to call a contemporary Jew an Israelite or a Hebrew. The first Hebrews may not have been Jews at all. OK, let me read it one more time and we'll move forward. Strictly speaking, it is incorrect to call an ancient Israelite a Jew or to call a contemporary Jew an Israelite or an Hebrew. The first Hebrews may not have been Jews at all. All right. So we, we, we have to understand that. So let's go back to our foundational scripture. Let's go back to Romans chapter nine. All right. And I'm going to highlight verse 24. OK. Even us. Whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. Let's break this down. Now we're going to deal with the word Jew here. We dealt with Gentile, but now we're going to deal with the, the word Jew. Let's deal with the key to understanding this verse. Right. The key is what? Now we need to understand what this word Jew means. So most Bible readers do not truly understand the word Jew. That's a fact. But let's deal with the etymology of, the, of this word real quick. This is coming from the etymology dictionary online. It says it's one of the Jewish race or religions. And this is what's really startling because you'll start really when you start, um, you know, really um, having and uh, accumulating a lot of references and resources. And, you know, you'll you start really getting a, a, a grasp of just how much of the influence, how influential the Jewish community is on our literature, on our writing, on everything. And I'm going to show you here how they even have influence on this, this etymology.com website. You see here, what should raise flags? What it raised flags for me when I first saw this years ago, and I've been teaching on this for years. When did the Jewish community become recognized as a race or religion? That's a red flag. So it says one of the Jewish race or religion. Right. When they be, when did they become a race? We could religion is not a red flag to me because they have the That's why they have a religion. Right. And their Judaism it confirms them to being a Jew, according to their religion, according to their belief system. But it, when did the word or when did the Jewish community become recognized as a race? All right. But when you go further in the definition here, you'll see where it says um, the French, uh, ooh, ew, and, you know, go th going through all of that Latin udium, um, nominative of udeos from the Greek udeos um, from Aramaic ju Judah high, um, which you also see Hebrew Yehudi, a Jew from Yehuda, which you get the word Judah. You know, you get the gist of it. All right. So one of the Jewish race or religion, that's something that really stood out for me. But one good thing that I do and I encourage you guys, don't be so do not be so dependent on online references like the etymology dot com. Make sure you purchase some physical books so you could do a comparison between the two. Right. Let me tell you, let me let me take you to um, a reference that I have. And this is screen print from a physical book that I have here. Right. Bart etymology dictionary definition of Jew. All right. This is what it says. Right. And it's on page 404. It says Jew probably before. And as you see, 12th century, almost really similar. But it says um, borrowed through Anglo French. But you see, it reads the same. But notice that what you don't see here. You don't see race. Let me show you here. 
when when was the Jewish community, as we know them, ever recognized as a race? So you don't see race there. You do not see race there. All right. Let's go further here. Let, let's 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 go further. here. I just proved that here that we have a problem here. We have a conflict here because online says Jew is recognized as a race. Now, many of us are so dependent on electronics. We so dependent on going online and looking at the etymology dot com definitions of words, but not realizing you still need to have what? Another witness. That's why Deuteronomy makes it clear. Um, chapter 17, I believe, makes it clear when it tells us to at least two or three witnesses for anything to be what established. So when you're studying scriptures, make sure you have two or three witnesses. That's why it's easy to debunk those that are trying to say that we're not under the law and they import um, improperly teach Apostle Paul because the way they teach Apostle Paul they contradict the other disciples. You will not see not a single disciple saying that we are not under the law. Not a single disciple would confirm the way many are interpreting Paul's letters. Paul's letters is not confusing. The confusion is those that are reading Paul's letters. Paul's letters are written specifically to leaders. Literally, he's not writing it to the parishioners. He's not writing it to the lay people. He's writing it to the leaders and the leaders are supposed to do what? Um, you know, respond and, you know, implement whatever suggestions or rec recommendations for that assembly. So we have a lot of people just because they have a high level of academia, right? Uh, accomplishments, right? Are not truly leaders, especially if they not, if, if they poorly um, teach in Paul's letters. OK, but anyway, when was the Jewish community, as we know them, ever recognized as a race? I'll say it again. When were they ever recognized as a race? So let me go to another piece of reference here. And for those that want to uh, want the answer to that question, I encourage you to go to a presentation, a live presentation that I did on Judaism. It's a three hour presentation, but I guarantee you, you go through that three hours. You're going to get a lot of information on how to easily debunk. What we what we're witnessing today. So let's deal with a reference here. Facts are facts by Benjamin Friedman. I didn't have enough time to. Uh, put some of his audio here, but one of his lectures uh, from the 50s is on We Woke Now. And I encourage you guys to listen to that and you'll see him explaining what I'm getting ready to share with you. But he'll go even further with that. He is a Jew. He is someone who tried to warn the United States about the deceptions, the tricks, the tactics. But what they did was they label him just like they label anyone that goes against this machine. They label him as being all over the place. They excuse me. They literally began to demonize him. But he was a millionaire back in the 50s, used his own money to print up uh, printouts and everything, trying to warn the people, tried to warn theologians. Theologians were scared to even have conversations with him. He challenged the theologians from the universities. Fact. All right. So let's see what he says in his book. Facts are facts. You could buy it. Um, you know, so I encourage you to buy this book. It's a lot of um, nuggets within this book. And I encourage you to watch the video. That's on we woke. All right. But here it is. The available original manuscript from the fourth century to the 18th century accurately trace the origin and give the complete history of the word Jew in the English language. And these manuscripts are to be found all the many earlier English equivalents extending through the 14th centuries from the fourth to the 18th century. And I can tell you, you will not find the word Jew prior to the fourth century in any writings. All right. I, I want to make that clear. That is a middle age uh, construct. OK, let's go further here. From the Latin Udeos to the English Jew, these English forms included success uh, successfully. All right. So these I'm not going to read all of these, but you see the different um, the evolution of this word. But then it goes on to say, and then finally, in the 18th century, Jew, the many earlier English equivalents for Jew 
throughout the 14th century. And you see, see more here. And then it goes on to say, and then also finally in the 18th century, Jew or Jews. All right. So you you get the gist of it. It goes on to say with the rapidly expanding use in England in the 18th century for the first time in history of greatly improved printing presses. And it goes on with the history of that right there. But let me go to another point here. So let me go to the Jewish um, encyclopedia so you can see the definition And this. Um, pretty much you'll see lines right out with what he what, what he's saying here. This is um, the um, volume seven. OK, let me pull it up here. It says here the word Jew up to the 17th century. This word was spelled in Middle English in various ways. And you see just what I read here. All these forms were derived from the um, old French. You. All right. So you see it right here. OK. And then it goes on to say derived from the Latin Accusative, you know, and we went through this right here. Um, Judaeum, um, and then it goes on to say with the um illicit of the letter D in um Latin Judaeus was derived from the Greek Udeos, and then you, you know, you go through it and it, you know, you get the gist of it, right? And um, let's see here, and it goes down to say with the adjective, it says from the proper name Judah, seemingly never apply to members of the tribe. And see, this is where you start seeing some deceptive things, even when you read the definition. It says, from the proper name Judah, seemingly never apply to members of the tribe. <laughs> it, you know, it, 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 this is where you really have to say, stop it. You know, they, they, they just, you really have to say, stop it. We know David, you know, out of the tribe of Judah. We know that, um, you know, the Hebrew Israelite Messiah, <laughs> the lion out of the, the lion out of the tribe of Judah. Anyway, it's easy to debunk this, but you can see the manipulation here. All right. It goes on to say, however, but to members of the nationality inhabiting the south of Palestine. All right. So this is the other part I want to highlight from going back to um, Facts or Facts by Benjamin Friedman the secondary meaning of Jew. Now he highlighted the initial um, definition of Jew. The word is like a transliteration of a transliteration, but this is what he was exposing is how from the 18th century on, this word has taken on another meaning, a very deceptive meaning. All right. So let's go back to his book. This is what he says. The general, the generally accepted, there you go. That there's that word again. You guys make a note of this. Generally, it says the generally accepted secondary meaning of the word Jew today, with practically no exceptions, is made up of four almost universally believed theories. Notice his wording here. These four theories are that a so-called or self-styled Jew is a person who today profess uh, professes the form of religious worship. And it goes on to say, known as Judaism. And you guys know, and if you understand the law of return, Aaliyah, right? Um, they define a Jew as someone that's what? Practicing Judaism, or uh, they, they define it as someone that is born of a Jewish mother. Okay, let me, let me, Drink some of my, my juice here real quick. All right. Sorry about that. I had to drink my, my juice because my voice was getting a little dry here. Okay. So again, they came up with these secondary meanings. OK, so anyone can be a Jew. Right. By denouncing whatever you believe and doing what? Taking on their belief system, Judaism. Right. But then number two, he says a person who claims to be long uh, to belong to a racial group associated with the ancient Semites. I'll say that again, a person who claims to belong to a racial group associated with the ancient Semites. 
right? We already proved in their own literature, they say that um, it's incorrect to call a Jew an Israelite or a Hebrew, right? Number three, it says a person directly the descendant of an ancient nation, which thrived in Palestine and Bible history. Notice what it says here. A person directly the descendant of an ancient nation, right? You see, you see how they play with these words. Okay. He goes on to say a person blessed by divine intentional design with certain superior cultural character denied to other racial, religious, or national groups all rolled into one. Let me read that again. A person blessed by a by divine internet, I mean, excuse me, intentional design with certain superior culture character denied to other racial, religious, or national groups all rolled into one. He goes on to say in his book, the present generally accepted secondary meaning of the word Jew is fundamentally responsible for the confusion in the minds of Christians regarding elementary tenets of the Christian faith. <laughs> you see what he just said here? He said that word Jew, this is basically what he's saying, that word Jew is a word of confusion that is completely blinding, that are completely stumping, that is becoming a stumbling block of those within Christianity. Elementary, when he says elementary, foundational stuff that they should know, but they have no clue. And they continuously, um, the pastors are continuously spending tens of thousands of dollars for education that is not even teaching them the basic truth of the foundational things that they should know about their tenets of their belief system. The present generally accepted secondary meaning of the word Jew is fundamentally responsible for excuse me, responsible for the confusion in the mind of Christians regarding elementary tenets of the Christian faith. Do I need to read it one more time? Let me read it one more time. Let me just read it one more time. The present generally accepted secondary meaning of the word Jew is fundamentally responsible for the confusion in the minds of the Christian Christians regarding elementary tenets of the Christian faith. Now that gets this right here. I got a little humor here. I'm, you know, we got... all right. So that deserves that. Okay. Let me do it one more time. That desi- that deserves this. All right. Let me give you one more. This, this is what it also deserves that doctrine. All right. Do I need to do it one more time? Let me do one more. All right. That's what that deserves. That deserves those sound effects that I just put up here for those that are pushing and teaching this 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 deceptive doctrine and keep pushing this Jew, this term Jew. Even those that are waking or have awoken to the truth, continuously trying to say that we are the original Jews. No, we're not the original Jews. They are the original Jews. We are the original Hebrew Israelites, ancient Hebrew Israelites. So for all those that are teaching and keep holding on to that term Jew, here's one more. Here's one more effect for you. All right. There's one more. That That's one for you. All right. Thought I put a little little humor in here. All right. So that that that's the old Batman. You know, I was like, man, let me put, I, I, you know, I'll just see some of the old clips trying to be more creative. I was like, you know what? I'm going to use that and kind of incorporate that here. Whenever we see something that's that that's questionable, you're going to see those sound effects and then more. So, again, the present generally accepted secondary meaning of the word you is fundamentally responsible for the confusion in the minds of Christians regarding elementary tenets of the Christian faith. And we see that played out through people that call themselves apologists, especially those that are within the urban apologetic community, when they're coming up with terms called Hebrew Israelism. 
Hebrew Israelism. Who would have ever thought that they would take the term and make it into a demon, a, a, a monster, a, a, a de demonize that term? Hebrew Israelism. Ism simply means doctrine. Doctrine. Right. That's what it means. When you say Israel, Hebrew Israelism, the doctrines of the Hebrew Israelites, the Hebrew Israelite Messiah that they call Jesus Christ is a Hebrew Israelite. Their favorite apostle, which is Paul. Guess what? He says that he is a Hebrew Israelite out of the tribe of Benjamin. <laughs> but they demonize the term Hebrew Israelism. That tells you just how how terrible we in the time that we live in. How do you demonize the term Israelism? How do you how do you demonize these terms? How? How do you? How do you I, I, it's unbelievable how they have taken these terms and made it into a just really demonizing. All right, let me leave that alone. I'm getting a, getting a little carried away with that. All right. But how do they just take something and just completely demonize it? That is an example. That's what that's what he's saying right here. The secondary meaning is now what? Causing confusion, causing so-called educators can't even get the basic principles down between what is a Jew and what is a Gentile. And they and they will um you know, fight tooth and nail and making people believe that they know what it means. So let's move forward here. So let's understand, you know, understanding of the 12 tribes. Let's deal with this real quick. Let's go back to Romans 9, 24. Let's go back here. It says, even us whom he hath called, not of the Jews, but only, excuse me, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. So let's let's understand this. The Greek word used in this verse for Jew is udeos. So let's see what udeos mean. As you see here, it says here, right? Judah or Juden, an example belonging to Judah. Then you see the word Jew in in parentheses, Jewess of Judah. But then you see the sub entries here says number one, Jewish belonging to the Jewish nation. You see how it still push. This deception, you see the subtle um, influence of Judaism, the, the Jewish community on even the stuff that we reference. So Jewish belong to the Jewish nation to Jewish as respect to birth, origin, religion. But let's break this down some more. Let's deal with the Hebrew definition of the word Jew, transliterated word Jew. Right. We see here Judah. Or in parentheses, right? It said, um, you see, um, yeah, Jehuda, and in parentheses, Judah. The name of five Israelites, also of the tribe, descended from the first and of its territory. So guess what? When you start understanding the word Judah, right, it's used as his son. It's also used as the tribe. It's also used as the southern kingdom, nation. Right. Which consisted initially of Judah in the Benjamites. All right. Let's go to um, Romans. Um, let's go to verse 25 and 26. Let's go to break this down. All right. It says this. As he said, saith also in Hosea, which he's dealing with Hosea, Hosea, I will call them my people, which are not of not my people and her beloved, which was not beloved. Now, let me make this clear. The entire book of uh, this entire chapter of Romans is dealing with the Israelites, the northern and southern kingdom, all the way up to verse 24 that I read. And he's continuing on dealing with the northern and southern kingdom. Instead of saying the northern and southern kingdom is transliterated in the Greek to what? Gent Jew and Gentile, instead of saying the northern kingdom, whether it's Ephraim or whether it's um, Israel, you know, uh, or um, outcast. I'm going to show you these terms here and the southern kingdom, Judah. Then he goes on to say, and he said, as he said, also in uh, Hosea, I will call them my people, which were not my people and her beloved, which was not my beloved. 
And it goes on to say, and it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, ye are not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living Allah Hayim, the children of Yahweh Allah Hayim. What scripture is Apostle Paul quoting? Let me bring it up. And matter of fact, I can show you every scripture he's quoting in um, chapter 19. Hosea chapter two, verse 23. So why is the apostle Paul quoting this scripture? Why? Well, here it is. And I will sow her unto me and the earth, and I will have mercy upon her that had not obtained mercy. And I will say to them, which were not my people, thou art my people, and they shall say, thou art my God. All right. Allah Hayim. But let's go further with this. Let's not stop there. Let's go to Hosea chapter one, verse two. And let's let's pull this all together so I can show you that he's dealing with the northern and southern kingdom. Right. Let's go to chapter one. It says the big the, the beginning of the word of Yahweh by Hosea or uh, um, Ashawai or Ashawai rather. Right. Ashawai. Um, and Yahweh said it to Hosea, Ashawai. Go take unto thee a wife of whoredoms. And it goes on to say, um, you know, uh, uh, let me go back here. Let me make sure I got it correct here. Yeah. All right. Let me, uh, I thought I had another verse here. So let's deal with the Hebrew definition of Hosea. Right. Now, again, some would say how uh, the pronunciation. It depends on where you go at in the verses here. So. Um, you know, excuse me if I have my, you know, if my, um, my sl- if I pronounced it one way uh, based upon what you see here, because also it's pronounced how shy. But here you see um, here when you take it out of the actual verse, you see um, a sha, I mean, a shawa, right? A shawa, you know, o she, you know, uh, transliterates to o she. But also you'll see how a shy um, it's transliterated to how shy as well. I mean, uh, it um, it comes from Howard Shai. Jose is also called Howard Shai in many of the texts as well. So I wanted to make that clear here. All right. But nevertheless, so we see here, right? His name means deliverer, right? The name of five Hebrew Israelites, five names of five Israelites. We see Hosea, Hosea, and Oshea, right? And you see that it means what it says, Hosea or Hosea or Oshea. It means salvation. Okay. Hosea's name means deliverer. His name comes from the Hebrew word for salvation, right? Which we see here, Yasha, right? And some would say Yashai or Yashai, right? But nevertheless, Yasha, which means to be open, free, to be safe, avenging, defend, deliver, help, preserve, rescue, be safe. You see what salvation means? You see how deep it is? It's more than just what we think it is. It's more than just saying that my soul, you know, I'm, you know, I, I, I have a relationship with the most high. Now it's more than that when it comes to the blood descendants of Israel. You know, the Gentiles, you know, those that are not Israelites, they don't have to deal with what we're dealing with. They didn't lose their heritage. We lost our heritage. We don't. Have, they're the ones that's benefiting from it. So when we deal with salvation, salvation is different for an Hebrew Israelite versus those that are not Israelites. Because we, the Most High made it clear that he's going to what? Return and restore our heritage. All right. So Hosea, Hawashai, was instructed by Yahweh to marry an adulterous woman. So who is the adulterous woman? Let's deal with it real quick. What is the significance of her children? Let's deal with it. All right. Let's go to verse three and four of the same text. It says this. So he went and took Gomer, the daughter of uh, the blame which conceived and bare him a son. And Yahweh said unto said unto him, call her name Jezreel for yet a little while. And I will avenge the blood of Jezreel upon the house of Jehu and will cause to cease the kingdom of the house of Israel. Now, the this kingdom of the house of Israel, this is referring to the northern kingdom and the children that um, Hosea, how a shy produced, 
with his wife, Gomer, represents the judgments that are coming to the northern and southern kingdom. All right. Let's go further here. Hebrew definition of Jezreel. All right. This is how you pronounce. I mean, um, um, this is what it means. God will sow. All right. That's what it means. All right. First son of Hosea, the prophet. OK, so Jezreel simply means Yah scatters. That's what it really means. It simply means Yah scatters. So let me give you some more information. So the name was a sign that our Yahweh Allah would scatter Israel and end the dynasty of King Jehu because of the cruel murders he had committed in Jezreel. Yahweh had chosen Jehu to be his agent of judgment against the evil king Ahab and the infamous Jezebel. In executing justice throughout the land, Jehu went far beyond what Yahweh had instructed, killing even some of the innocent. Although he had been appointed to execute justice against the murderous house of Ahab and Jezebel, he became ruthless and committed atrocities that went well beyond that was called um, that that was called for. All right. So once he launched these righteous um, executions, he obviously became gripped with power and political self-interest, setting out to eliminate anyone who could conceivably be a threat to his authority. So this is where we come into another one of his children, Lord Ruhama. All right. Let's go to um, verse six and seven. And this is going to further prove that Paul is dealing with the northern and southern kingdom. And she conceived again and bared a daughter. And God, Allah said unto him, call her name Loruhama or uh, La Rakama. I'll say it again. La Rakama. For I will no more have mercy upon the house of Israel. Right. See how it's referring to the house of Israel. This is dealing with the northern kingdom. But I will utterly take them away. Verse seven. Now we see him with the house of Judah, right? This is dealing with the southern kingdom. But I will have mercy upon the house of Judah and will save them by Yahweh their Alahayim and will not save them by bow, or excuse me, by bow, nor by sword, nor by battle, by horses, nor by horsemen. So we see that um, this is referring to the northern and southern kingdom. And Apostle Paul is not doing what many in the church tend to do, take one verse and then try to build a narrative around a verse, Paul is actually making references to the prophets here. He's making reference to here. He's teaching about the northern and southern kingdom. He, When you say Jew and Gentile, that is the northern and southern kingdom. But I'm going to show you that not everywhere where you see Gentile is referring to the northern and southern kingdom. I'm going to show you here. Right. But I want to make it clear. Keep in mind, all through what we call the Old Testament, I refer to it as the established covenant. You know, once you get towards the end of the book of Judges and then you start pressing forward, you start seeing what a divided kingdom. You start seeing the divided kingdom that began to be divided among themselves. That what um, basically came to fruition um, when King Solomon died and his son Rehoboam took over. And based upon the prophecy that was given in punishment to King Solomon. That's where you get Jeroboam. All right. That's where the kingdom split. Ten tribes went north. Two tribes went south. Right. And eventually the, Levit um, the Levites fled as well to Jerusalem. Which was the place of peace. The place of what? Shalom. Yara Shalom. The place of peace. Right. So they fled there. Right. And they were under the protection of the southern kingdom. OK, so that's what it refers to. OK, so I want to make it clear. You see that all through. All through. The prophets all through. But now suddenly we get to the renewed covenant and it just stops. We get someone that is a master in the Torah which is the apostle Paul, then suddenly he doesn't mention the northern and southern kingdom? Absolutely not. He did mention them several times, but he refers to them as um, 
it's transliterated as Jew and Gentile. That's really the northern and southern kingdom. All right. So let's go further here. All right. Let's go further here. All right. So the name means right. Um, did I put it up here? Right. Um, not pitied. No mercy. That's what the name means. No mercy. OK, so La Rakama means no pity, no mercy. Her name was also a sign of judgment, you know, sign of coming judgment. OK, so her name La Rakama means that it was time for justice and judgment to be executed without mercy. That's what the, that's what it means there. So Hosea's second child was to be a sign of that Allah would be uh, would no longer forgive or show love to Israel. The day of mercy had passed. The Assyrian army would be allowed to crush the northern kingdom of Israel and to deport the survivors to other nations. So the Assyrians would be allowed to deport the northern kingdom um, survivors to other nations nations to other territories to other countries making them what outcasts so the northern kingdom were also called outcast dakai i'll say it again the northern kingdom were also called outcast dakai let me prove that so the northern kingdom were also called ephraim i'm going to prove that All right hosea chapter 1 verse 12 through 13 Oh, actually, Isaiah, rather, excuse me, I didn't change that. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 12 and 13. I got to correct my slide here. So um, the actual scripture is Isaiah chapter 11, verse 12 through 13. And it says, and he shall set up an ensign for, and that's a sign, ah, for the nations and shall assemble the outcast. There you have that word, dakai, of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. So we see the northern kingdom is also referred to as what? Outcast. Outcast. The northern kingdom are those that are what? Not from the nation of Judah. So when you see the word, that's why I said yes and no. When you see the word Jew, meaning those that are not um, um, Jews, per se, those all, I mean, Gentiles, all those that are not Jews, that's why I said is is partially correct. It's partially incorrect. Actually, what it is, is those that are not part of the southern kingdom. In other words, the Israelites, the tribes that are not part of the southern kingdom. This is why the Hebrew Israelite Messiah had to say what? Love your neighbors and love your enemies. Pray for your enemies. Because when you actually understand the text and when you go to Exodus, you'll see it there. And I'll do a teaching on that again. You'll see what, it, what he's actually saying is love those that are not in your um, those that are in your tribe, but also those that are not in your tribe. That's in the opposite tribes. So just because you are in, let's just say, the, um, the tribe of Levi, right, doesn't mean that you have you treat those that are in Issachar like they're your enemies. He's saying that regardless of the tribes that you're part of, we're still one. All <laughs> right. So I can debunk that whole thing with more scriptures, but I'm keeping it simple here. OK, so again, he says and he shall set up an ensign for the nations, a sign for the nations and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel. That's the northern kingdom and gather together the disperse of Judah from the four corners of the earth. He goes on to say the envy also of Ephraim shall depart and the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not envy Judah. Ephraim, Aparyam, shall not envy Judah, Yahawadah, and Judah shall not vex Ephraim. So Ephraim here is also being referred to what? The northern kingdom and also the southern kingdom is being referred to who? Judah. So Here's one last scripture that I want to bring out right now. Here's one last scripture right now. Here we go. One last scripture. Who are the Gentiles in this scripture that I'm getting ready to bring up? Let me show you. Acts chapter 15, verse 16 and 17. See, this scripture I'm going to show you is not referring to the 
Northern Kingdom. But let's see here. Let me pull it up here. After this, I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which is fallen down. And I will build again the ruins thereof and I will set it up. Verse 17, that the residue of men might seek after Yahweh and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith Yahweh, who doeth all these things. All right. So I'm going to pose that question to you guys. Who who are the Gentiles in this verse? Who are the Gentiles in this verse? If you want to post comments, I'll, put, I'll bring it up. But who are the Gentiles in this verse? Who, who are the Gentiles in this verse? Let's see what we see here. All right. All right. My sister, uh, Shawnee, wow, I just I learned something new every day. Hey, we as long as we keep going into that word, we I'm learning something new as well, because it, it, it you, you really as you go deeper into the scriptures, you start seeing the level of deception and deceit that's being taught to our people. So I'm learning. I'm learning so much every day. The more the more I go deeper into the languages and the scriptures and cross right all you start seeing the level of deceptions, just how bad it is. All right. So when you say all other nations, um, appreciate you. Let's see what else we have here. All right. Someone else was um, making a comment here. Let me see what else we have here. All right. You'll see here. All right. Division and divorce. If there is a divorce, then you are out of the covenant. OK, let's see what else we have here. All right. Let's go to answer this question. And I'm going to show you the scripture that um, Luke is actually making reference to. All right, let's go. Let's get it in. Here we go. Let's deal with residue. The etymology dictionary definition of residue. This is what it means. It says remaining left over, remaining left over. OK, let's go to Amos chapter nine, verse 11 and 12. Let's see what it says. In that day. In that day will I raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen and close up the breaches thereof. And I will raise up his ruins and I will build it as in the days of old. But then it goes on to say that they may pos possess the remnant of Edom. Uh oh, wait a minute. <laughs> remnant of Edom. That's 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 Esau's. Some of his descendants, but he said remnant because there's a judgment coming to Esau's descendants. But there's going to be a remnant because when you understand the battle of the three kings against the Moabites, you had the three kings, one from the north, the king of the northern kingdom, the king of the southern kingdom, and also the king over the Edomites came together. And all three came together and they fought against the Moabites defeated the Moabites. Right. And then when you read the book of Amos, you'll see how the most high punished the Moabites for defecating for um, uh, uh, on the king um, um, burial, passed judgment on them because they insulted that king who helped that Edomite king that helped the northern and southern kingdom in battle to de defeat them. The Moabites, a bastard seed from the descendants of Lot and his daughters. All right. So we see here Gentile in that text is referring to the remnant of Edom and all of uh, all the heathen. Right. And this is remember, we got to understand when it says when you see this word heathen, see, this is where you could start getting more detail of understanding who they're referring to. They're not referring to the um, the Romans. They are not referring to the Greeks. As I stated before, when you see the word heathen, you can look it up. The difference between heathen and the difference between um, pagan is that heathen is referring to what uncivilized African tribes. Who are idol worshipers? You can look that up. And guess what? When you look at what they deem to be uncivilized, they look at the Egyptians, you know, because look, they, they done raped and, and took everything of the Egyptians as well as what was prophesied. So the remnant, because remember, Moses said, do not what abhor or hate Esau. In other words, descendants of Esau, he said he they are your brother. He is your brother. Then he went on and said, also, do not what? Hate against the Egyptians. 
right? Because there was a relationship there, even though the Pharaoh decided to go against, right, the Most High and began to um, um, uh, suppress and try to do, use genocide on Israel. But before that Pharaoh came into play, Joseph had a great relationship with that Pharaoh. But it says what? The remnant, not saying all, but because they have to pass. They have to come out under judgment. But there are some that what that are um, that, as you see here, which are called by my name, that, that are what that's big. That's going to be what covered and protected by the most high. Called by my name, reputation, not just his literal name. All right. So the Gentiles that um, is being referred to, I'll put Apostle Paul, actually is Luke. Right. Um the Gentiles Luke is referring to in this text is the remnant of Edom uh, uh, and all of the heathen, which are called by the name of Yah or Yahweh, his reputation. All right. So right there, people, there you have it. There you have it. There you have it. We just we just completely shut down. Whatever teachings that are out there, when people are trying to say that when you see Jew and Gentile, Jew is referring to all of Israel and um, Gentile is referring to all that are not Israel. No, actually, um, when you see the word Jew, that transliterated word, um, that deceptive word, right, it actually is referring to the southern kingdom. And when you see Gentile, it's referring to the northern kingdom. And as I gave you other scripture, another scripture here, you see that it's referring to when you see Gentile. All right. There, you see the remnant of Edom as well as what heathens other what African <laughs> nations. Not referring to the Greeks, not referring to the Romans, but you see that word heathen pagan refers to the civilized groups, the civilized idol worshipers, the civilized ones that's going against the most high, according to um, these people that have trans taken our, our scriptures and perverted it is referring to those Romans, those Greeks, those systems that you still see part of Christianity, still see part of Catholicism. It's referring to those guys that they say are civilized and organized, but they just don't believe. In our Allah so I hope that helped helped out. Let me see here. Let's see. Let's look at some of the comments here. You know, I really hope that helped out. I hope that uh, um, given have given you guys clarity. All right. And for anyone that continue to teach this poor and deceptive teaching, um, this is for you. That is for you. All right. That is for you. OK, so I, I hope and pray that you guys had a. A blessed time. All right. Let's see. Let's look at some of the comments before we wrap up here. Let me see. All right. Let's see some of the comments here. All right. All right. Jew means Southern King. Jew means Southern Kingdom. Gentiles mean Northern Kingdom. Exactly right. Let's see what else we have here. Got to rewatch this after you. OK, yeah. Yeah. If you came in late. Yeah, definitely watch it from the beginning. All right. Let's see here. Yes. Yeah, some Hebrews still teach the uh, the Christian doctrine of the Gentiles is, is you know, it's really a very deceptive tool, uh, a, a very deceptive drug, per se, a very deceptive doctrine that many of us still haven't um, broken free of, you know, Anytime I hear someone say that we are the original Jews, it makes me cringe because that tells me that we you know they truly don't understand the history and origin of that word. We even have brothers and sisters that are practicing Judaism that when that whole Jersey City incident took place, they decided that they want to separate themselves. They came out publicly to denounce us. The Hebrew Israelites denounced us that they have no um, affiliation with us, but yet they were trying to complain how the Jewish community, as they know it, right, that they trying to what, um, please, you know, suck up to, are treating them, mistreating them. 
This is why our ancestors documented that they did not want to call themselves be called Jews. They made it clear even inside the Jewish almanac that I made reference to. It's even inside there saying that they did not want to be called Jews. They cool with not. We were cool not being called Jews. We hey, we're is we Hebrew Israelites because we understood and understand today that we are the original people. We're not converts as they trying to make it seem, make it appear to be. All right, let's see what else here. Why do why does many of us look like they hate uh, our taken language, uh, our taken language? You know what? Um, that's a great question. And I use this analogy over and over again. The dirty dime and the shiny nickel. Right. Um, the Jewish community, as we know it, they control most of the media. They control most of the. The, the sort media outlets, the, the news, the, 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 the stations, the radio state, they control most of them. Most of those you control uh, uh, some, you know, I heard that, that old saying, whoever controls the pages control your thoughts. So if they control the media, they, they are able to dictate your thoughts. They are able to dictate your thoughts. And so what they, they really made, that would turn Jew into a shiny nickel and made being a Hebrew Israelite into a dirty dime. And many of us are chasing, trying to be confirmed and validated by that dirty dime, uh, that, um, that shiny nickel and don't even realize, even though they may have given the appearance that our heritage is that dirty dime, they need our heritage. They got to, they need our heritage in order for them to what? Keep that shiny nickel. Keep their, their their deception going. So again, guys, I hope this really blesses you. I know we, uh, I know it's late night for some of you guys. Um, it's late night in, in in my area. It's almost two in the morning here. It, actually, it is two in the morning. But I hope this helps you. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to post it. Um, and I and I will see it in the comment section. If you haven't clicked the like button, click the like button. All right. Um, post your comments also inside the comment section because sometimes this this chat does not um, come up in the replay. So I encourage you guys to uh, again take a look at um, re look at uh, I mean look at the video again, replay it, take your notes, and uh, we got more things that we're going to deal with. We're going to deal with words of confusion. We're going to deal with the word church. We'll deal with that um, next Saturday night. We'll deal with that next Saturday night. All right. That's a very detailed uh, teaching. We'll deal with that to knock down um, that word of confusion as well. And if you have any other words of confusion, feel free to let me know and we will deal with that. All right. But with that being said, family, I'm going to call it a, a, a night. I appreciate you guys for tuning in and we'll do this again. We'll do this again um, next Thursday. Um, me, Pastor Jerry Carr, my cousin, who is up in who's located in Springfield, Massachusetts, for those that are up in that area, you know, uh, feel free to go pay him a visit. Uh, First Fruits is the name of their ministry. But uh, we will do this again next uh, Thursday night, this upcoming Thursday night. So with that being, being said, family, have a great night. Again, Shalom Lak, Mash Parka, Barakata, Tawada, Akyam. Rakata, Tawada, Akwath. So um, love you guys. Have a blessed night.